Now, last week we looked at the strong gospel. This week we're going to look at the strong church. And I'll give you a sneak preview in one sentence. It has to do with unity. Because any church that isn't unified isn't strong anymore. United we stand, but divided we fall. That's so true in many ways. So the background history, looking at Acts chapter 18, I'll paraphrase this. In Acts 18, verse 2, Paul arrives at Corinth for the first time, and then he meets Priscilla and Aquila, who were Jews who were expelled by Claudius Caesar in 49 AD, uh, according to Acts chapter 18, verse 2, is where it mentions that. Outside history tells us exactly where it was. For two years, the Jews were expelled exactly the way the Bible says. Now, working as tent makers, you know, Paul was a tent maker. Well, he worked with Priscilla and Aquila. Paul preached the gospel to the Jews every Sabbath for a short time until, the, until Silas, Timothy, and other members of the mission team would rejoin him. They assisted in the mission support with the, from Philippi. And uh, as Paul alludes to in Philippians chapter 4, uh, you gave a gift more than once for my needs. For even the Thessalonica, you gave a gift more than once for my needs. And as he worked down a a a Achaia into Athens and then Corinth, where he would spend the next 18 months, guess who supported him? The church that gave according to their ability and beyond their ability which was uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 through 4, which was the Philippian church. And so he had successfully, now when pressure arose against Paul by some Jews, he moved on to complete his prosperous second missionary journey. And instead of sitting there and making the, he was already there 18 months, instead of parking there and saying, no, I'm going to sit and, fi and fire it off, he said, no, I could do more damage than I can good. I'm going to keep moving. God always has new opportunities. Keep that in mind. Now, he had successfully completed what he set out to do in the first place, which was planting new congregations, then strengthening them. And that was the Great Commission, make disciples of every nation, baptizing them into the possession, Istoonoma, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and, and then you follow up, teaching them to observe. You get them in the kingdom, you grow them in the kingdom. That's the one-two punch of the gospel. In Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 30, uh, uh, 26, we read of the account of one of the strongest um, teachers in the New Testament that we have mentioned. Certainly doesn't surpass Paul or Christ, but I would probably rank him number three or four behind Peter or just plain third. But Apollos, it says, there was a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth. First of all, I want to pick these apart a little bit. Alexandrian, Alexandria was the most educated city in the entire world. The largest library was there. Second largest library would have been in Pergama. Third would have been in Ephesus. And I believe they had a half million scrolls in there. It was whoever had. And so when you think of Alexandrian by birth in the context, they're talking about well-educated. You know, a preschooler, when you think of Harvard or Oxford or something, you're not thinking of shoes necessarily when they were talking about wisdom and knowledge. Uh, if they said Alexandrian, if you heard the word Alexandrian, Alexandria, Egypt, which is on the west coast on the shoreline of Egypt, you, that was the educational center of the world. Not even Rome could boast that. So he was from Alexandrian. He was an eloquent man which means that he could speak well. He demonstrated his high level of education. So it just wasn't the fact that he was from Alexandria. Alexandria identifies his source of education and his eloquent speech, the depth of his education. And he came to Ephesus and he was mighty in the scriptures. Now we know where he focused his education 
He was a Jewish man, so he focused it in the law. Okay? Now, this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. Somewhere along the line, he's come into contact with other Jews who converted to Christianity, and he's learned things about Jesus Christ along the way. And being fervent in spirit, he was not mild milk toast approach. He was, boy, he, he used everything God gave him, and he was promoting Jesus Christ. He was speaking and teaching accurately things concerning Jesus. I mean, honestly, when you look at that, you would love to have somebody like this show up in your congregation, wouldn't you? And say, hey, I'm going to live here, I think. That'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? Well... And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. So he's already defending the name of Jesus. It says, but notice it says, being only acquainted with the baptism of John. 18 years prior to this is roughly when John the Baptist was put to death. So he knew only of the baptism of John. So the disciples whom he studied with along the way, who he heard about Jesus and he was left to formulate everything, that man did not have a pure source of the gospel. He came across some other zealots, possibly, likely, the 12 men in the very next verses who did the same thing. There were 12 men Paul encountered in the region of Ephesus, and they were walking about, preaching and teaching Jesus, knowing only the baptism of John. Okay? And what that led to was, Paul said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? He was talking about the laying on of hands. They said, we haven't even heard there be a Holy Spirit. Now, if you heard the, the true gospel account right, there's no way you could not have heard of he, the Holy Spirit in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Paul would conclude the second uh, book to Thessalonians. That's the basis of the fellowship. He used the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit there again. So what happened at the end of that account in Acts chapter 19, 1 through 6? Instead of arguing, they were baptized right. See, you can't be taught wrong and baptized right. You can't have that. But notice what Priscilla and Aquila do. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, now, do you think they knew that he was eloquent and he was mighty in the scriptures? He had a fervent spirit. He was teaching so many things just dead on accurate about Jesus. They could have easily said, you know, I don't know what Apollo said, but he might have said something like, well, all you have to do is just ask Jesus into your heart. Or all you have to do, maybe he introduced dry cleaning or something. I don't know. But whatever it was, the only negative thing we have was that he knew only the baptism of John. And so they took him aside. Notice they didn't say, fourfold demon of hell and call him out in front of everything. Too many times, the Church of Christ, I'll let the denomination speak for themselves, but the Church of Christ does a great job executing their own. They do. We must always have Christian tact. This would not have turned out the same way had Priscilla and Aquila confronted him in front of everyone. They took him aside and explain to him a way of God more accurately. More accurately. There's a Russian proverb, give me a child one or two, I will, I, I will uh, correct him. Give me a child three or four, I will mold him. Give me a child five or six, I will bend him. Give me a child or seven or eight, and he's set in his ways forever. The idea behind that Russian proverb is that you must gingerly and in an early way confront those things which need confronting, but you also need to praise and mold and shape those things which are already good. And that should be, this should be a lesson to us 
Now, we don't know if he was rebaptized, but if you sandwich this, remember 1826 of Acts in the original before man put the numbers in there. I can assure you that when Luke wrote this, he didn't write, okay, number 26. Okay, new chapter, new thought. No, it goes right into 19, 1 through 6. It was right next to each other. And I am firmly persuaded in the spirit of the pattern of the Bible that that was just the further explanation connecting the first to the last. And so, with all boldness, we can say that they talked about his baptism needed some explaining to do. And then, right after this, what we see is they not only take him aside, they not only show him a way of God more accurately, the only thing they could have talked about was a thing that was out of whack. The thing that was not accurate. And the only negative thing they even brought up was that, and it lines up perfectly with the very next six verses. So, after a lengthy discussion with Priscilla and Aquila, Apollos decided to go to a place where his skill set would be best used. And it's here we find that he was enlisted in debating the rabid Jews of Corinth, the very ones that would have Paul chained up to a block, the same one that would drive Paul out. I can almost picture Paul saying, okay, I'll go. Oh, boy, you got your work cut out for you now. <laughs> My replacement. And he is an eloquent speaker. By the way, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 10, Paul admitted, I'm not an eloquent speaker. I'm not impressive when you meet me. But when you meet what I wrote, that's where the power is. He said, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. You know, here's the problem that came up during that time. In 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2, we already talked about there was great division in the church. And the, this culture elevated sophist speakers who could wax eloquently. Apollos was that man who could stand with them toe to toe. Which, just a side note... We all have our strengths and weaknesses, and when the church is unified, somebody within that church can minister to whatever problem comes up. If they can't, somebody else can, somebody else can't together, they holistically handle the problem. But see, with Paul's case, this culture was addicted to fancy speakers, eloquent speakers. And so many of the church members were downplaying Paul's apostleship for his much less eloquent style. In fact, they tried to demean Paul. Oh, come on now. Yeah, I know Paul wrote. I know he's an apostle, but come on, man. He has a lisp. He stutters. Something's contemptible about his speech. For all you know, I mean, he could have had Burt Lancaster's face, but talked like like, hey, how you doing? I don't know what it was, but it was contemptible. But what he wrote, that's where the power was. Well, so then they demoted Paul, and they put Apollos up there, and they even put Peter in there, because Peter was a better speaker. By the way, Peter even wrote about Paul, focusing on that he wrote things so deep that Moses would have to pause and think about. I mean, so... Now you have Paul gone, and then there, the very one who brought them the gospel, the very one that introduced them to the, the wonderful, beautiful, salvational message of Jesus dying, buried, and resurrected, and how to fulfill that in our lives. And they demoted him, and they started bad-mouthing him, thinking that they're doing God a service. I'm going to promote Apollos. And just like division occurred in the first century group, in the first century Corinthian church, it could happen in the 21st century church. How do churches effectively deal with 
with this type of uh, division that they have. And believe me, every church, if you're not on guard for it, it will happen. Every, just like families, if you don't nurture and you don't spend time together and you don't tap into each other's strengths, families fall apart, church families fall apart. He says, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to babes in Christ, the King James says. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and are you not walking like mere men? They were divided. They were messed up. And Paul says you need to do a checkup from the neck up. And he gives them four realizations they must be able to have in order to have unity. Four realizations. Paul says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Well, that comes through realization. Having your mind transformed. Transformed through the renewing of your mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. So, here's the four realizations which minister unity. Which minister unity. Here's the first one. Realize that we are fellow workers in God's field. We are fellow workers in God's field. Look at 3, 5 through 9. In 3, 5 through 9, what then is Apollos and what is Paul? Servants whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one, I planted, Apollos watered, but God giveth the increase. So neither is the one who plants or the one who waters anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are, all, we are God's fellow workers and you are God's filled, God's building. Now think about what he said there. He's saying, listen, if you're out in the field and I'm out in the field and Apollos is out in the field, doesn't that make us filled friends? <laughs> and Paul's saying, for we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field. And then he makes a transition. God's building. Ooh, did you get that? He made a transition to that. We have the same purpose, the same goal, but ultimately it is God who giveth the increase. The focus is always on God. That's the first thing we have to realize. If, if Tom is a fellow worker and Pam is a fellow worker, and Hayden is a fellow worker, and Gina, and Brown, and John. If we're all fellow workers, guess what? The focus now becomes the field instead of the, of the fellow worker. It's hard to turn on anybody when you have the same mission. It's really hard. Here's the second thing. Realize that we share the foundation of Christ because he made a transition now to a building. Listen to what he says. In ten, 3 verse 10 through 15, according to the grace of God given to me, like a wise master builder. Remember that phrase underlined, wise master builder. I laid a foundation, another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than what one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds a foundation of gold, silver, precious stones, hay, wood, straw, each man's work will become evident. Underline that. We're going to get a little bit of history here, which will make it all make sense. For the day will show of it, because it's to be revealed by fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work, which he has built on it, remains, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, 
yet so as through fire. What are you talking about, Paul? Well, the word that Paul uses is architectin for wise master builder. It's where we get the word architect from. Now, an architect today is someone who draws up the blueprints, and then they give it to the contractor, and then they follow the blueprints of what is to be made. They test the structural integrity from the foundation all the way up. But an architecton in the first century was the guy who only built the foundation. That's it. His whole focus was the foundation. And whatever the foundation, it's interesting, you know, they would, they would be the one who would lay the cornerstone and oversee everything because if the foundation is messed up, the structure isn't going to stand. Now, it's also of interest in knowing each man's work will become evident. The standard rule was this, that whatever you built the foundation out of, then you could go ahead and build the like manner structure above it. Now, the architect, on, the architect, he got paid. His you know, even to this day, there are thousands of foundations. I've seen many, many foundations in Greece that were laid 2,000 years ago that they're just as solid as they were back then. But what happens is there's a guy who comes in afterwards. He's the contractor, the regular builder. He'd begin to build his structure. Now, he might use a variety of materials such as gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. Okay? He, had, he could do what he wanted there. And then once he got paid, if the structure ever fell, you know who they went after? Not the architect on, the one who built something that didn't match the foundation. And so, even though he got paid, because that foundation was proven sure and steadfast, it was solid, man, it was thick, it was deep. That guy, the architect on, to become an architect on, you had to be the best of the best. But that guy who built on it, five years down the road, ten years down the road, if somebody's walking in that temple and a big chunk of it comes down and smashes three people, guess who they're coming after? They're, they're going to suffer loss because the foundation was sure, but the building wasn't that good. And so, what are you saying, Paul? Well, we all have the foundation of Christ. If we've been baptized into Christ, we entered covenant, with Christ, we have a sure foundation. You know, other verses in the Bible talk about this. We'll get to those in just a moment. But Peter had an interesting phrase. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus took a survey. He says, who do people say I am? Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're this guy. Some say you're that guy. Some say you're John the Baptist. And he asked Peter, who do you say I am? He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Now that was the right answer. And then he said, thou art Peter, little stone, and upon this rock, big stone. What big stone? That I am the Christ. I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. You think about that. He's using that exact same language. The rock is Christ. Romans 9.22. Daniel 2.45. You remember the stone cut out of the mountain without hands that crushed the iron, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, and the clay. Crushed it all. That was Jesus Christ. And Paul confirmed that in Romans 9.22. So we all share the foundation of Christ. We share the fact if we have succumbed to the covenant promise of God, in other words, died to ourself and entered the covenant of living to Christ the way he told us to, if that's 
you, then you and I share the same foundation. It's very simple. A hermeneutic is the lens that you look and you view everything through. You've heard the saying, through rose-colored glasses, well, through the uh, speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible's silent, hermeneutic, you look at it, and what do you come up with? You come up with the gospel and how to obey it. But then if you take those glasses off and you put another hermeneutic on to do your other little projects, let's say the hermeneutic is called speak where the Bible speaks and where it doesn't speak, I'm at li liberality to say what I want. That's a totally different pair of glasses. And the problem with that is and switching your glasses over and over again. I believe in the gospel. Oh yeah, but I believe in this. I believe in the God. You keep doing this, you're going to get poked right in the eye. And then you won't see it all. It's a dangerous thing to do. Don't forget anyone who believes the same gospel that we do shares the same foundation that we share. You might disagree with what they're building on top of the foundation, and you have a right to do that. Because we're warned in the Bible to be careful what we teach. In fact, teachers can be condemned. Be not many teachers, knowing we shall receive a greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, able to bridle his old tongue. But you know, there are things that maybe I teach and, and you have the responsibility. If I teach something, and I guarantee you, no matter where I preach, there's something I've said that I might have disagreed with you, but then I hear what you have to say, knowing we're on the same foundation, and you're, you're, you're another contractor, and you say, hey, have you thought about maybe building it this way a little bit? That's okay. That's called sharpening. Iron sharpens iron. So does one man sharpen another, but never confuse the found. We share a rock solid foundation, and more on that, we, re, uh, we realize, here's the third realization, that we are a temple of God. Look at verse 16 and 17. He says, do you not know you are the temple of God? He's talking to the church. The you isn't one guy reading it. The you is the church. He says, you are a temple, the te a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Wow. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy and that is what you are. He's talking about the church. So not only do we know we have the same foundation, but together we're building a structure which lines up with the foundation according to what Jesus said. And that is a, that's part of the co-mission, the great co-mission. Jesus' mission, and he co-opted us to fulfill it. It's not the first time nor the only time that he would talk about that. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, he says, or do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Then he turns it to the personal nature. There he turns it to the personal nature. And listen to what he says. Who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not of your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify your God with your body. What, what is he saying there? Okay, in the process of us building together a holy temple of the God, if you're a, a misacting brick or stone in the process understand that you have a personal responsibility too. But then he would go back to the corporate in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, among whom the whole building being fitted together, he's talking about the building again. Being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. Then he turns it to the personal, who you also are being fashioned together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. We have a personal and we have a corporate responsibility to understand our temple connection. So we have a foundation and we have a temple connection now. 
And then the third thing. Fourth thing. We realize that we're not know-it-alls. We're not know-it-alls. 18 through 23, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks he is wise in this age, he, he must become foolish so that he can become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God, for it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, that they are useless. So then, let no man boast in men. Because that's what they were doing. I'm baptized of Paul, Apollos. They're putting their trust in men, not the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, Paul would write in 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. One of the biggest causes, uh, he says here, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, which is Peter, or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all things belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. One of the biggest causes of division in any church family is when one is a know-it-all. Yeah, you want to shut down a discussion? Now, a know-it-all isn't somebody who knows a lot. A know-it-all is somebody who can't learn anymore because he knows it all. There's a big difference. It's okay to say this. In fact, let's take a moment of reflection, of group reflection. Okay? Repeat with me. I'm sorry. I don't know everything. You ready? Okay, and this could be hard. It might be like happy days when Fonzie couldn't say, I'm wrong. Remember that? He couldn't say he was wrong. I'm sorry. I don't know everything. Ready? I'm sorry. I don't know everything. Now, can you imagine if everybody would start out any potential heated discussion by saying, I'm sorry. I don't know everything. And go into it that way instead of, I know. Paul would later say, let him who thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. And here he tells us, he says, the one uh, who has the wisdom of this world, let him be foolishness. Stop putting street uh, cred on people and detracting it from Christ. Raise your hand if you like a know-it-all, somebody who has all the answers. Go ahead. Raise your hand. Okay. You proved the point. Nobody likes to know it all. We should always go into a discussion to eagerly learn because we can learn from each other. I learn from my grandkids. It doesn't mean that I haven't studied harder than them. We learn from our kids. You could read everything in the Bible and every parenting book in preparation to be a parent, but only practical experience will point out that you learn more from the not books than you do from the books. And so, 8 verse 2, anyone who thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. That's the humble approach. So, in conclusion... We are always to strive to keep the division out of the church. But it's through holding to four self-realizations for which this can be done. We must realize we are fellow workers in God's field. We share a common foundation. We are the temple of God. And we, uh, we are not know-it-alls. I don't know what the don't is there. That's what happens if you type and you take your glasses off. The bottom line is, is that we must always seek unity.